tonight's facts, what gives us our sense of direction? Where did those flying ducks come from? What happens to our blood donations? With Bill Oddie, Debbie Ricks, and Billy Butler. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and welcome to Facts for Sunday the 31st of January. Now, on this day in 1983, we all had to clunk click every trip when the wearing of seat belts became compulsory. And in the first two years, there were 12,700 fewer deaths and serious injuries amongst front seat passengers, so it really worked. One traveller who today in 1961 was definitely wearing a seat belt was Ham, the first chimpanzee in space. He was launched from Cape Canaveral at 5,000 miles per hour and travelled a total of 420 miles at an altitude of 115 miles above the Earth. He must have been bananas. Happy birthday it's happy birthday to Christopher Chatterway, who's 57, Gene Simmons, who's 59, and Phil Collins, who's 37. Now, after our item on telephone answering machines last week, we got a little letter from Sonny Johnson from London, who sent us, along with the letter, a little message, which he says virtually ensures that people will not hang up. Here we go. I'm unavailable, so here's the routine. Just leave a message on my answering machine. Now don't be nervous, it's only a phone. Leave your name and number when you hear the tone. Wasn't it terrific? I want one. Mr. Donald Eller of Stockport phoned in to ask how rumours began that opal was an unlucky stone. Well, several myths have surrounded opal over the years, probably because the stone's ever-changing colours were attributed to some magical powers. Many people, however, believe these rumours and the other ill-luck stories were encouraged by the big diamond companies to stifle the increased demand for opal at the turn of the century. And confused Elizabeth Lambert of Bedford wrote, Please, please, can someone give me Neil Diamond's correct age? She says Radio Bedfordshire gave his age on his birthday last Sunday at 44. The Sunday Telegraph said 46, and Fax said 47. Well, who's right? Well, Elizabeth, who else but Fax? A real gem amongst the diamonds. There are certain things in life that you only find out when a crisis occurs. Now imagine if you were in a restaurant and you were so down on your money, all you could afford was one single piece of scampi on toast. What would you ask for? Let's see if the great British public know. What do you call a single scampi? Uh, very lonely. <laughs> scampi? What's a scampi? Is it a fish? A prawn. <laughs> the crisp. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. Scampi? Scamp? What do you call a single scampi? A bachelor. Single scampi is unge. What's the singular of scampi? Scampi is just scampi, isn't it? Raw prone. <laughs> it's just a scampi! <laughs> just as I thought, nobody knew what a single scampi was, but I think this gentleman here will be able to tell us. Oh, we've had worse. Come on now. Margaret Bauer wrote a fax with a question that will strike a chord with lost souls everywhere. Why is she always getting lost, she asks, but her husband, Bruce, has a perfect sense of direction. Well, here's Bruce. <laughs> to prove it, Bruce found his way inexorably into his chair. <laughs> Margaret had a bit more trouble. Is, is it really this, this much of a problem? Oh, yes. Yes, it really so, is. Where, where, what was your most embarrassing moment in this? Uh, well, I was once at a, a hotel to dance, and I went to the ladies, and I couldn't find my way back to the ballroom. I've wandered about the corridors for about 20 minutes. <laughs> it's, better, it's better than not being able to find the ladies in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, before putting Margaret's problem to the experts, we decided to do our own little fax experiment. So we took Bruce and Margaret to Manchester's Arndale Centre. We are cruel to our guests, aren't we? This was strange territory indeed for these good sports from South Devon because we wanted to see how long it would take them separately to find the Market Street exit. Here they go. <laughs>
<laughs> it happens to people who live in Manchester every day, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> anyway, we got oh, you back, you. fortunately. We rescued her, right? But when we, we decided to give her another little test, a little chance, this time, in the rather calmer atmosphere of the Cheshire countryside. Now, they started from Engine Vane, where Bruce gave Margaret a ten-minute start to find Armada Beacons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the touching. If you're going to be lost anywhere, I mean, it looked a nice place to be. Oh, yes. Hey, we surprised. Oh, uh, you surprised Bruce that time, I think. Yes, yes? she yes? did indeed. Yes. Yes. One of her quickest homing <laughs> bits. Yeah. yeah. But you were still fairly slow because, in fact, you gave her a ten-minute start. Nevertheless, Margaret did do rather better in the country, right? So we're going to come to that in a minute. Now, Robin Baker here is a zoologist and also a world authority on the subject of the sense of direction, right, in, in animals and in people. Now, Robin, why is it that Margaret did better in the countryside than she did in the town? Well, people use all sorts of things to try and find their way around. They use landmarks, of course. Um, they're most important, but without knowing it, they use the sun and they use stars. You didn't have stars then. Uh, but most strange of all, they use the magnetic field. Now, the Earth is like a big bar magnet. It's got lines of magnetic force going around it. And everybody knows that you can read these lines of force with the ordinary compass that you hold in your hand and yeah. that points north. What most people don't realize is that somewhere in the head, there's something very similar uh, that allows you to read the magnetic field naturally. Now, at orderly edge, all of those things, the landmarks, the sun and the magnetic field, were all a lot easier to use than in the Irondale Centre. The magnetic field in particular in the Irondale Centre is very weak, very scrambled and very difficult to use. Right. Robin, thank you very much. Bruce, thank you very much. Margaret, thank you very much. And the very best of luck getting back to your seat. It's over there. Turn <laughs> left, turn right, about ten yards. Thanks a lot. This plane is part of a medical service unique to Australia that's provided a vital lifeline for people in the bush for over 50 years. The heart of the service is the radio room. From here, outlying stations can call for and receive free medical attention any time of the day or night and also make telephone and telegram calls. The Royal Flying Doctor Service had its beginnings in about 1920, when outback missionary John Flynn, who'd seen too many tragedies strike people who were isolated from help, proposed a combination of medicine with aviation to provide what he called a mantle of safety for the people of the inland. With the help of Adelaide wireless engineer Alf Traeger, who designed and built a pedal-driven generator to power a Morse code transmitter and receiver, Flynn saw his dream finally become a reality in 1928. There was also help from the founder of Qantas, Sir Hudson Fish. He provided the original pilots and ground support for the first official flight. Now the service has 14 bases serving more than 2,200 outstations. The aircraft are modified to carry doctors, nurses and patients and each carries a wide range of general medical supplies plus emergency obstetric, resuscitation and surgical equipment. Before the service began, it sometimes took two weeks to get someone to hospital. Now no one, resident or tourist, is more than two hours away from medical help. Well, we're going to Minterby to uh, run a clinic there. Um, that's really like a general practice clinic. Uh, with quite a bit of trauma and so on just from the mining accidents they have up there. Is that the most common sort of thing you have to deal with in this area? Well, certainly meant to be. Uh, they're all going hell for leather there for the opal mining and uh, using explosives, heavy machinery, um, jackhammers and so on. So there are quite a few accidents there. Mobile clinics are also held regularly to provide medical, dental and eye care services to isolated communities sometimes deep in the outback. The worst part of the job is the boredom, that is, the places where we go to are many, many 
miles away. So you're stuck in this aeroplane for hours and hours and hours on end. And you've virtually got nothing to do. And the only way to pass the time away is virtually just get a good book and snuggle up to it and pass the time away like that. We go into airstrips at night that are uh, sometimes fairly rough desert strips with uh, the only lighting being uh, kerosene in tin cans. Um, Flying over the desert in the summer, we uh, all face uh, turbulence and that's created mainly from uh, the hot air coming off the desert and um, it can be too turbulent up to 12, 14, even 15,000 feet and it can throw this aeroplane around dramatically and make everybody very queasy and uh, upset. What, what does it do to the patients? Uh, it, well, if they weren't sick before they got on, often they're very sick by the time they get off. <laughs> of the 100,000 patients treated each year, about 9,000 need evacuating to hospital. But the service still relies on government handouts and fundraising to buy new equipment. And this is the latest addition. It's a Super King Air prop jet and is set to revolutionise the service. These sophisticated planes cost nearly £600,000. Carrying the latest medical and aviation equipment, they can fly high above the thermals, faster and further, to bring the Royal Flying Doctor Service even closer. We've had a letter from Diana Flax oh, yeah. from Sale in Cheshire. She wants mm. to know where do flying ducks come from? Flying ducks? Why is she writing to us? Diana who? Diana Flax. 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 Oh, wait a minute, I remember her. Wasn't she at, uh, she were at Batty Street Mixed Infant no. when we were. She oh, was. Yes, I she was. She were. Her. She were. You remember? She always had a runny nose, a mucky jumper, and great big holes in her stocking. Filthy little yes. devil. That's she her. were, weren't she? Oh, That's her, yes. <laughs> She wasn't a bad headmistress, though, was no, she? No, not bad, no. <laughs> what, wasn't it Henry VIII? What? No, no, you know. it was Diana Flat headmistress. No, 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 no. <laughs> Invented dogs. Flying oh, dogs. You're right, you're right. That's what they say. Apparently, the story goes, he was always eating, you see, and at one banquet, he was served up with a ruddy great plate full of roast ducks by one of his barons, you see. But he couldn't manage them, could he? Not so, like you with your fish fingers, you Yeah, never down. mind about that. Anyway, he had a reputation, old Henry, so he had to try and keep that up. He was munching away, but the last three ducks, he couldn't manage those. I remember now. That, didn't he throw them at somebody? He did. He threw them at somebody. One at barons. Aye, I remember. And he missed. He missed, that's correct. But... They hit the wall, and the three ducks, they stuck right. there, and that's the origin of flying ducks on the wall. It you is. don't believe that, rubbish, straight up. Fred. Well, I don't know. If you want to get real facts, I'm afraid we'll have to have a look in this great big wonder book of a million facts you never know you might need. And probably But you never probably will. won't know. Let's have a look, shall we? Here we go. Dandruff, dog collars, ducks. Here we are, flying for you. So, let's see. The first recorded set of flying ducks were designed by Mr. Watkins of the Beswick Pottery in Stoke in 1938. 1938? That was the year your Harold had his leg off. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Danny Whitehouse remembers his grandfather telling him that his father used to make brass copies of China flying ducks at the turn of the century. And this explains why the China ducks usually fly to the right and the brass ducks, because they're a sand molded copy, fly to the left. You've lost me. Uh, it's too technical for no, me. Let me let look. me look at it. Pass it over. Where are we? Here we go. Look, look listen to me. The heyday of the flying ducks was the 1930s, and by 1971, even Beswick had stopped manufacturing them. Well, mm -hmm. at the beginning of this decade, a resurgence in popularity began. Now, this was partly to do with the best-known set of ducks. Oh, so you'll know these. Oh. Hilda Ogden. Hilda Ogden, ah, I know her. She were at Batty Street mixed in No, <laughs> Coronation Street. Oh, no, thinking Henry VIII, oh, no. People are once again buying flying ducks, but not generally in single sets. These days, the collection's likely to cover a wall. Oh. A daft idea that is. Go and make me tea, woman. I'll finish it off. Anyway, because of this upsurge in popularity, originals and old sets of ducks are becoming difficult to find. And people will pay up to 60 to 100 pounds depending on the size and quality of the ducks. Must be quackers. 
A spin-off from the traditional flying ducks has emerged in the last few years, and this includes, amongst others, flying frogs, flying cars, flying pigs, flying hippos, and, of course, flying pickets. <laughs> you sure the more industrial, tea. that one. Oh, no, tea. not a fish finger. I can't manage all this lot. I'll tell you what, these three can go for a start. Henry VIII had right idea, I'm telling you. <laughs> now, for StarQuest. Several people have written in with various questions about blood, including Denise Johnston from Edinburgh, Hilary Plunkett from Keithley, Graham Keynes from Clacton-on-Sea, and Caroline Robinson from West Germany, would you believe? Apparently, we're seen by cable television in many European countries. This week, Little and Large went to Liverpool to answer some of your questions and a few of their own. Well, we're here, Ed. You wanted me to give something. What is it you want me to give? Blood. Oh, I don't fancy that, Sid. Come on, there's nothing to it. And besides, you get tea and biscuits afterwards. How many biscuits? As many as you want. Oh, come on, then. Matron, what are you doing <laughs> to me? <laughs> this is a test we do for anemia. Oh, no. Is it going to hurt me? Do you think so? Hey, you haven't done it, have you? It's finished. Would you like to press on that for me? She's done it. Didn't hurt. So I've given blood. Well, why do you stick it in that jar, that blood? Because this needs to sink. There's your blood just gone down Is it there. sinking? It's sunk. Does that mean I'm OK? That means you're fine and you can now go downstairs. <sighs> My veins aren't as wide as yours, Ed. Sid, how much are they taking? Only 450 millilitres. 450? How much have I got? Well, it just depends how big you are and how much you weigh. How do you mean? Well, for every kilogram you weigh, you've got 70 millilitres of blood. Well, 450 isn't going to hurt me, is it? What do we do after this? Well, we're going to find out what blood group you are. Are we all the same? Oh, no. There's four main blood groups. A, AB, B, and the most common, O. O. And you can either be rhesus negative or rhesus positive. I thought that was a monkey. Oh. Are you feeling OK? Yeah. I wonder if I have a rare group, it would be Super Eddie. Oh, like Super Sid. You never know, do you? Come on, Sid, what's keeping you? I've finished now. Just lie there for a few minutes. Right. How many biscuits now? <laughs> oh, well, that was painless, wasn't it? The thing is, Docs, I want to know, do I get anything for doing that, you know, like a medal or something? Well, you get a certificate, but you've got to give a good few more times before you get a medal of any sort. Oh. How long before my blood gets back to normal? Well, that's difficult to answer, because blood isn't just one thing. It's got um, cells in it, red cells. Now, they take about 90 days to get back to normal. It's got white cells and platelets, which take a couple, couple of hours to make up normal. And there's a fluid part called plasma, which you make up in 24 hours. In fact, some donors only give plasma, and they can come more often because they make it up more quickly. I want to know, what's the difference between animal blood and human blood? Well, some animal blood's very like human blood, but most of it's very, very different. Oh, so Michael Jackson can get a transfusion from his monkey then? <laughs> Maybe. Actually, can, can it be mixed, animal blood and uh, human Some blood? can, but in theory, but never in practice. Uh, what does blue-blooded mean? Uh, I think that means me, actually, yes. Well, <laughs> it doesn't mean that, does it? Yeah, well, we th it, it does mean people who are aristocratic or oh. noble, and the reason we think why people are called blue-blooded is in the old days, the aristocrats never went out in the sun. They were all pale-skinned, whereas working people went out and had suntan skin. So you could see aristocrats' veins through their skin, so they were known as well, blue blood. Uh, what happens to our blood now? The blood you've just given yeah, now? Yeah. Well, this will go back to the transfusion centre, and the blood will be put in a fridge. And the samples that we took, separate samples, they'll be tested. We'll test your blood group to make sure which blood group you are. And we'll also test for hepatitis, AIDS, syphilis, any of the diseases that can be transmitted in a blood transfusion. And then the blood itself will probably be divided up into the red cells, the plasma, and the platelets, so that probably about three patients will benefit from each unit of blood that you've given. Okay, tell me the worst. What am I? We'll just find out, shall we, Eddie? This is your unit of blood. Oh, yeah? There you are. You're an O rhesus positive. O rhesus mm. positive. And what about uh, Super Sid? Is he a Super Sid? He's an O rhesus positive as well. Oh, Sid. 
That's the most common blood there is. Yes, it may be the most common, but it's the most needed. And now for some quick facts. Joanne Gibbs, she of the lovely smile from Air in Scotland, asks, why don't horses have to go into quarantine? Well, it's because, as with all these other animals, this great list here, they're classed as dead-end hosts. Now, that's a weird phrase, dead-end hosts, that means that although they can catch rabies, it's almost impossible for them to pass it on to humans. However, all the animals have to be licensed when they come into the country, they have to be cared for by professional handlers, and they have to undergo regular checkups by a vet for the following six months. Agnes Barlow from Stockport in Cheshire wants to know what the hexagonal shaped structures that you see in pictures of the Stock Exchange are. Well, they're known as jobbers pitches. The old Stock Exchange was a great marble hall built in 1801 and its trading floor had huge pillars which were hexagonal shaped at the base. Jobbers, the people who bought and sold shares, would stand in front of each of the six faces of the pillar and the brokers, acting on behalf of the public, could wander around and see which jobbers were offering the best prices. When the new stock exchange was built in the 70s, the pitches on the new trading floor were built in the same shape as the old pillars. Nowadays, they're rarely used because most of the stock exchange trading is done using computers. You probably thought that everything that can be said about Australia has been already said. But Beryl Howe from Newmarket in Suffolk asked a question that even Australians she and her husband met on holiday last year didn't know. Where does the name Australia come from? Well, since the Middle Ages, explorers have believed that a vast unknown continent existed in the Southern Hemisphere. And this was known as Terra Australis Incognita. Australis is the Latin for Southern. The name Australia evolved from this at the beginning of the 19th century when the first free settlers arrived. Thank you, Yauchin. What exactly is that? That's a scampo. More than one, we call scampi. On its own, scampo. Scampo. Thank you, Yauchin. Would you like some parmesan? Ah, yes, please. Thank you. Heaven knows. Mwah, scampo. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is it for today. Next Sunday, I shall be finding out what exactly it means to have a high IQ. And indeed, why don't we all have one? And now, here's Roy Rogers. This is just part of 6,000 miles of fencing that runs right across the continent of Australia. It's called the dingo fence, and it's designed to keep the dingoes in the north away from the sheep grazing the southern pastures. Next week, I'll be visiting a sheep station and finding out what life there is like. And I'll be finding out how to turn your body from a shapeless blob into a hunky chunk of beef cake. <laughs> and you better watch out. Because there's a tease about. <laughs> if you have any comments on tonight's programme, do you know the origin of flying ducks? Or have you a question you want facts to answer? Then write to Phil Oddy, Facts, BBC TV, Box 173, Manchester M60 1FA. Or call our fax line on 061 814 3222.